I am delighted um, to present uh, our colleague from the the Quinlan College of Medicine today, Dr. Charles Stewart. Uh, Dr. Stewart is a professor of internal medicine and an endocrinologist. Um, he's an expert on obesity and obesity prevention. He has been NIH funded, um, multiple NIH grants to the tune of about 25 million uh, as PI or program director over his career. Uh, he's closing in on 100 publications, uh, peer reviewed publications on uh, the topic of obesity and, and, uh, and prevention and uh, endocrine, endocrine, uh, endocrinology. Uh, he was trained at SUNY Buffalo and then did his uh, residency and fellowship training at Duke University Medical School and then went to the University of Texas Medical Branch where he worked for 23 years as, um, as faculty and as a, uh, a scholar and, and uh, administrator. Uh, he, came to UA, or he came to ETSU at, uh, in 2000 and is presently vice chair of uh, internal medicine, uh, executive vice chair rather, of internal medicine. And today he's going to talk to us about um, obesity science. And uh, part of the goal with Grand Rounds is to begin to understand um, who are the scholars across the university with whom we may connect. And I mean, that's the whole, uh, we, we wanted, the whole purpose of Grand Rounds was, what are we doing? Yeah, you know, I mean, and how can we grow this? And, and the, uh, the intention here is to get connected with folks who are doing good stuff and to get our scholars connected with them and to begin to discover how we can collaborate. One of uh, Dr. Stewart's um, close collaborators here in the college or someone who's been working with him since he's been here is uh, uh, Dr. Peterson, John Peterson, who regrets that he can't be here today due to a family, uh, a death in the family out of state. So um, anyway, I just wanted to to uh, say, say thank you, uh, Dr. Stewart, for coming. Uh, and if you remember to turn your mic there. I think it's turned. recording this. Hopefully it's and, turned on. And we, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks. OK. Can you test to see if it's on? I did turn it on. Is it working? Yes. All right. Well, um, maybe he wanted me to come and talk about my research. I didn't do that. <laughs> so, well, we, but we will find out about it. I think. Yeah. So anyway, what I wanted to do was to share with you some of the science and some of the data behind this so-called obesity epidemic that we have in the United States. It's certainly almost every day in the media there's something about the obesity epidemic. So it's it's good to kind of be. Uh, well based in what the background is and understand the scientific aspects of it. And this advanced all right the first time, but there we go. <clears throat> I skipped over that last slide because we're not doing CME and I don't have to do disclosures. So basically I don't have any important disclosures. This slide is one that I stole from an advertisement that came across my desk uh, about a year ago, kind of showing the evolution of man, and as you can see from uh, biped uh, monkey up through the human, but where are we going? Well, the evidence is that we have one more stage that is quite significant, and that is biped to uh, is a slide that, it, that I got off the internet, which is kind of interesting in that it's, it's mocking three major sponsors of the Olympic Games who are perpetrators of some of the causes for what you see in the guy in the yellow shirt here. This person is obviously not an athlete, but he's more representative of our entire population. <clears throat> so what are we talking about? What's obesity? And the definition of obesity has evolved over my career. And some of my early publications called obesity something that we don't call obesity. But we'll touch on that in the next couple of slides. There are often two flavors of obesity that are talked about, upper body obesity and lower body obesity. And they have different terms that we've used over the last couple of decades including apple shape for central obesity and pear shape for 
people who have a lot of generalized obesity that's not very centrally located. <clears throat> so defining obesity, now, you know, we, we can look at somebody and say when they're extremely obese, yeah, everybody agrees that's obese, but what is the cutoff? What, what do you call normal? And what was used for almost 100 years was weight for height. If you're 20% above your ideal weight, and we use the metropolitan life tables. Um, and I'm not sure the origin of the metropolitan life tables, but they worked, and they were pretty accurate. And I would say that they still are quite accurate in determining what's an appropriate or normal weight for height. What we're talking about now where we've used BMI as the main criteria for diagnosing obesity is we've moved the line away from that 20% up to a bigger number. And a BMI of 30, and I think that's on the next slide, but a BMI of 30, which is now used for the last 25 years or so as the cutoff for obesity, a BMI of 30. A BMI of 25 is called overweight. A BMI of 25 corresponds to that 20%. A BMI of 30 corresponds to about 43% on average above the ideal weight. But there are other things that we use. And one that sounds good physiologic, makes good physiologic sense is body fat content. So, but what's normal is, is hard to say. And body fat content that's listed here is above 25% for men and 33% for women. And I think that like all of these definitions, that's arbitrary. We've done body composition on the athletes at ETSU, and some of the data is pretty interesting, I think, on body composition of very healthy young people. The soccer team. <clears throat> They are. They run all the time. They're they're healthy. They're active. The body, the average body um, body fat content for the male is seven percent. For the female soccer players, eighteen percent. So twenty five and thirty three to me seems kind of high. If we're going to call them normal <laughs> in today's society. Unfortunately, athletes are considered unusual. They are not 50 or 60 or 75 percent of the population. They're down here in the belt of physical activity, way out here to be called even unusual or maybe even extreme. Skin fold thickness is another thing that some people are interested in. It's been done for a long time. I've never gotten into it myself because I think that it's so different from observer to observer. So I consider it to be pretty imprecise. But one of my collaborators over in exercise science, so in our research, we do that. We still do skin fold thickness. And changes occur when we intervene with exercise. Waist size, and this is often a cutoff, the, what's displayed here for men, uh, 40 inches around the waist as a cutoff for obesity. It's really a cutoff for central obesity. And one would say if it's over 40 inches in a male, that that's good evidence for central obesity, visceral obesity, and 35 inches in women. Now, it's very Americanized. These numbers don't work in Asia. If we're talking about people in China or Japan, those numbers have to be brought down considerably to say what's normal and what's abnormal. But we're all kind of ethnocentric, so this is what we deal with primarily. And body mass index is what everybody's using these days, and it's been defined by the National Heart Lung Blood Institute in 1997, came out with their criteria for overweight and obese that I've already mentioned, and I think there's a slide coming up that ha talks a little bit more about that. <clears throat> Body mass index is supposed to be easy, and it's supposed to be translatable between people of different height and different genders, and it's pretty good at that. If we want to 
measure body fat, there are lots of ways of doing it. And this slide is kind of busy, but it, it kind of compares accurately. And height and weight is cheap, but it doesn't tell you where the fat is. Waist circumference is a good thing to do, and it's easy to do. Um, again, very inexpensive. You just put a tape measure around someone's middle. And actually, if you have done it, you probably know that what you have the patient do is put their finger in their belly button. And that's where you make the measure. Uh, that's an improvement over it was the way it was uh, 20 years ago when I first started to do this, where it was you had people lay down and you tried to find the biggest number you could find in sort of the middle section of the body. But anyway, um, many of the measurements of body fat depend on how much water is present. So on here is deteriorated to, yeah, D2, uh, radioactive potassium, which are ways of measuring body water content. You take the, the body weight and use the total amount of water present, you can back calculate to determine body fat. Bioelectric impedance is something that's relatively inexpensive and quick and easy to do. You can do population studies with that. DEXA and MRI are very precise, very useful, but very expensive and very time consuming. So most large studies don't use them. So we would say if you're going to be doing clinical observations or large population studies, the best way to do that, the cheapest and most effective is height and weight and waist circumference, just two simple measurements. Body mass index. Um, this was put forward in a group by the National Head and Blood Institute in publication in 2007. And they said normal is 18 to 25 for BMI, overweight 25 to 30, and obese over 30. Um, and I would say that as one originally thought. Um, and I have a slide coming up, it may be a couple more down, a couple more series issue of what's normal and what's appropriate for overall population mortality. <clears throat> when we talk about the obesity epidemic, most of the stuff in the media comes from the CDC where they have been doing these telephone interviews since 1984. And it has been, somebody's looking around, do you, somebody do you? No. The, the data is, is, tends to be, um, it originally started off in the states, and it's gone on to actually be reflective of counties within states in the last uh, 10 years or so. But all of it is self-reported telephone interviews, which means that people underestimate their weight. In a lot of other things, they try to answer what they think they should say rather than what's actually true. So you probably have all seen these kinds of slides. Now, we had, we've had a series that goes back to 1984, but this is only from 94. And you can see the, the light color is the lowest, the obesity on the left, diabetes on the right. And no surprise to you as we move through these quickly that the two parallel each other. Diabetes is 95% type 2 diabetes. So when we talk about diabetes from an epidemiologic point of view, we usually don't pay much attention to type 1 diabetes. But as you can see, there are a couple of states that stand out as higher obesity than those around them. But as you move through these states, we're looking at huge increases in a fairly short period of time. So we've gone from light colored states 15 years ago to most of the southeast United States is the dark colors of, of obesity based on BMI of 30 or more being more than 25%. And the light colors were 14 or less. Yep, and they've gone away. 
Colorado is always in the best state for everything. If you look at obesity rates, diabetes rates, physical activity rates, Colorado, they either are really healthy up there or they lie. <laughs> or some combination. Um, when we look at BMIs of 30, and we see a prevalence in Tennessee of 33% of the adults with greater than BMI of 30, if you include what we used to call obesity and now call overweight, double the number. So if we're looking at overweight and obesity together in, in virtually every series, it's, it's twofold if you add the overweight to the obese. So we're talking about in the southeast U.S., Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, West Virginia, the prevalence of, of overweight and obesity together is in the 60s, 65 percent, two-thirds of the population meet those criteria. And this is a slide that just compares them right in front of you from the lowest to the highest over that 15-year period. So this is uh, a time course of the So more than doubled over a fairly short period of time. This one is another one based on other data. And this is the Bill Hughes data. The Bill Hughes data is not telephone surveys. It's in clinic in front of the investigator. They get a height and a weight. And, and you can see the graph that the behavioral risk survey underestimates about substantially more the real prevalence of obesity. No, no, no. The CDC randomly calls people. And, and it's something like 100,000 phone calls in a year. And they now have enough data so they can, they, and they have really colorful graphs of county by county. The problem with that is they go from 2004 to 2008, so I didn't bring them to show to you. They're a fairly short period of time. There's something like 300 questions, and they ask about drug use, tobacco, uh, lots of things. But one of the things that they do, and I've, I've gone through the very long, but they don't really talk about physical activity. They say, you know, do you do any physical? In the last month, have you exercised? Yes, no. However, there are, I forgot what they're called, but they're surveys that are to be given to children, people under 18. And those surveys are very detailed and very good. Um, I haven't had access to those data. But if we want to look at physical activity data that's from the CDC for adults, it's really pretty minimal. But it still is the obesity that we would expect it would. The physical inactivity correlates very closely with obesity and diabetes in the mass. So this is old data, and it looks at ethnicity and obesity. And it's showing age and ethnicity here. The green bars are from the Puma Indians. And these are for females. Points to remember here are the have by far the highest prevalence of both obesity and diabetes. The penis have been studied ad nauseum because I've had things presented to you many times that have generated by the, uh, the investigators of the Pimas. The Pimas probably are worse than most tribes. Um, although I've worked with several Indian tribes, including Sioux and South Dakota and Nebraska, in Alabama, Cushata, in Texas, in many of them, the at least the Sioux that we worked with in studies we did in the 90s were less than, but still much more than 
the Alabama Cushata in Texas were actually a little worse than the Pimas in the prevalence of obesity. That they reached 97% of people in their 50s were obese. And this is this obesity defined as weight, so it's overweight and obese lumped together. <clears throat> this one is, a, is an age-limitable study of training, but this is data that we published a few years ago in Native American obesity in China. And the obesity rate is really quite low in the population. They don't want to start out for it. it takes years to get fat. <laughs> So we're looking at a prevalence of obesity in kids at Head Start that's less than 10%. But by the time they reach puberty, um, we're looking at 35 to 40% prevalence of obesity. And the are the same. And then they stabilized more or less. So why do we care about obesity? Let's be explicit. What what is obesity putting people at risk for? Number one is, yes, diabetes. So type 2 diabetes is, has increased in parallel to this obesity epidemic. So we're having doubling rates of, of obesity and doubling rates of type 2 diabetes in the population. I can remember when the NHANES data from 1993 said the prevalence of, obese, of diabetes in the U.S. was 6.6%. It's now listed as 9.9%, and in many states, it's as high as 13 or 14%. In Tennessee, it's over 13%. So we're talking about a big increase. So what else? Uh, there's room for lots of things on this list. So. Well, Heart disease. Heart disease is there. Hypertension, sleep apnea, coronary disease. Coronary disease is higher in obese individuals, regardless of whether they have diabetes or not. And we don't think about it too much, but there are several malignancies in both men and women in obese individuals. Breast and colon are the two most common in women. And endometrial. And many OBGYN oncologists would say you'd never see endometrial cancer in a lean woman. It's an obesity related almost 100%. Do you consider coronary disease? CHF, well, we're lumping that in. Congestive heart failure would be like far along in the coronary disease in general. I mean, there are other causes, but that's the, by far the most common cause. I've got room for four more here. Uh, stroke is in there. I'm not sure I have it. Stroke may be, in, may be lumped with coronary disease mentally, but stroke and heart and coronary disease. Premature mortality. Premature mortality will cover virtually everything on this list. And it is clear that that is, in fact, what's going on, that life expectancy is declining. Osteoarthritis is something that you see. Obesity is a risk factor for osteoarthritis, and it's knees and hips, big joints, from bearing more weight. Depression. Depression is is linked to obesity. I don't think it have them on this list, but it is clearly a risk factor for that. But dementia is associated with obesity, and this is something that's only been uh, talked about the last four or five years. And dementia is more common in diabetes. That came out first. And now they're saying that obesity without diabetes is also a risk factor. Back, just a comment about osteoarthritis and bone disease. Obesity decreases your risk for osteoporosis. We found a positive thing. <laughs> <clears throat> but there are other things, and we're talking about things that are not clearly medical, but they will have medical implications, is that people have more accidents. They have more accidents in their home and more automobile accidents. 
tied to all of this stuff is lost work days. So we've heard we don't want to hire obese individuals. They're costly because of the health issues tied to obesity. And many large employers institute weight management programs with incentives. And Eastman is one of those that does that. So this is metabolic syndrome slide that I thought was coming up. <laughs> and the metabolic syndrome has been recognized since the early 80s and published extensively by this guy whose picture is shown here is Jerry Reven, who was a uh, research biochemist. And then when he retired as that, he became a metabolic syndrome publisher and studier. But he noticed, as did many other people, that these things travel together, that we're looking at obesity, hypertension, diabetes, coronary disease, and all of that is accompanied by hyperlipidemias, where HDL, the good stuff, is low, and LDL is high, triglycerides are high. And he, he speculated that hyperinsulinemia was kind of the root cause of all of these things. And I think that many of us still believe that it is a major contributor, and it's not necessarily secondary, but maybe even be a primary positive uh, issue in the development of all of these things. <clears throat> so I'll make a comment about the two kinds of obesity. And upper body obesity is worse than lower body obesity. And it's worse for everything. It, they have a higher prevalence of coronary disease, of hypertension. The insulin resistance in, in upper body obesity is about twofold higher in some comparisons where you take people of equal weight with visceral obesity compared to uh, generalized obesity. An interesting study came out actually five years ago now, but it is overall mortality in a large series of followed in Europe. It's actually a large series by anybody's measure. It's 360,000 people followed for 10 years in multiple centers across Europe. And they excluded people with known coronary disease or cancer at the onset. They did not exclude diabetes. But What's, I think, quite interesting is where the optimum, the lowest mortality is. It's not in the normal range. And I mean, we can put... <clears throat> it was a wide spectrum of age, and, but they excluded, I, I think the, I, I'm trying to remember, and I probably have it written down somewhere, but it was from young to at least middle age. Yeah. And the underweight is a, is a point that we need that, that's really quite obvious. And we're talking about 18 to 25 being called normal, but it's clear that there is a substantial increase in mortality risk related to people who are normal as opposed to those who are kind of at the upper part of normal or the lower part of overweight. The soccer team, yeah. <laughs> the soccer team's under, I mean, uh, yeah, underweight. Uh, no. Yeah. No. Actually, if you'll forgive me, I might be able to answer that. I made notes about the paper in this. Well, they included age 20 to 75, so elderly are in, included. Yeah, broken down by age. Yeah, and. Across all those ages, because I can see that being very different for a 20-year-old versus a 75-year-old. Yes. yes. I'm, I would agree with you. So the mean age in the whole group was 51. It says there were 10 countries, 23 centers anyway. You said F5, does it? Oh, start over. <laughs> There's my icon. There we go. So, you see the mechanism. What's, what's the mechanism? 
our grandmother is not a One thing we have to talk about is this thrifty gene hypothesis. And the thrifty gene hypothesis was coined by this guy Neil back in the early 60s. And it was to try to explain why Native Americans were having an epidemic of obesity and diabetes, which started in the 50s. It was not present before 1950. And the thrifty gene hypothesis says that there's an evolutionary pressure that hit all of us 100,000 years ago that gave people who could eat a lot, store energy when there's plentiful food, and then when there's the famine comes, they survive and reproduce, whereas the skinny people don't make it. <clears throat> and the Puma Indians were to before. There's a couple of pictures on the left from the Pumas in 1902. In 1902, the Pumas had no obesity. Disease. Studies done, uh, a couple of studies published in 1905 and 1906 from the Smithsonian and some others of Native American health basically said they were the epitome of health. They, there was no obesity, no coronary disease, people lived long, um, but something happened in 1906. So why is that? Did the genes change? Or did the genes change? What changed? That happened, yes. In the 1950s, the government came in and said, we're here to help you. And and it was well motivated. It was post-World War II and the economy was expanding and the government said, look, we're ignoring Native Americans. They're living in poverty and reservations. They don't have electricity. They don't have sanitation. They go between feast and famine. They're, they're, there's poverty. So we're going to help them. You know, butter and corn. On reservations, I've seen what canned meat looks like. It's scary. And and I've been. You open the can, and it's beef. But there's two inches. I mean, it's a big can like this. There's two inches of lard on top. And I'm told that they use that for cooking. And that this was a benefit. But and they've done very detailed studies of the humans, including metabolic rates and but but dietary history and then prospective evaluation over time without an intervention which would screw up their observations. So, different from what it had been when they were very, very, and very, um, The gene hypothesis we've mentioned, they're talking about you know, metabolism is such that you store energy as fat, when, and behavior is part of it, at least this is speculated, and observations uh, confirm some of this, that, and we know about protecting your energy when you go on a it's, it's a biologic protecting your energy stores no matter where you are. So when you're overweight and go on a diet, you get extremely hungry to protect that energy store. This is more Pima Indian 
data, which I think is, is interesting from a mechanism point of view. And this is about 700 people who were followed over as long as 20 years before they developed diabetes. And this is the NIH people two years. So they would do things like insulin levels and blood sugars and glucose tolerance. But of these 700 people, the average weight 20 years before diagnosis was 60 kilograms and it was 90 at the time of diagnosis. So over that 20 year period, there was a, an unrelenting increase in in energy stores <laughs> and obesity. And we're talking about a 30 kilogram weight for 20 years. So how much overeating do you have to do to gain 60 pounds in 20 years? <laughs> Not a lot, actually. Doing the math, it comes out to be very, very Talking about half a slice of bread. So the epidemic is worldwide. It's not just in America. And the, the rest of countries in this map are very big problems. And it's all of North America and, and a lot of Europe. Australia, South Africa. In areas of poverty in Africa, you can see there's either no data or there's very little obesity. And, and it's a very different story. Um, the poverty-related, obesity, -rela obesity problem in the United States is the opposite of what you see in Africa, where poverty is associated with being underweight. Poverty or low socioeconomic status in North America is associated with obesity risk. So this energy balance is not rocket science. It's easy to understand. And you get it out in your physical activity and your basal metabolic rate. And if you have an excess in any given day, you will store it in this clever tissue called adipose tissue that we all have more than we want. But it's like the basal metabolic rate is when you're very still, including during sleep. And it represents, in the average person, about 75% of your energy expenditure on an hourly basis. There's a meal-related thermogenesis, which is really energy that's utilized to digest and the food. And physical activity is, represents a small percentage of your energy expenditure. So what can you do about your BMR? Well, not a lot. You pick different parents. It's very, <laughs> very genetically determined. So you really can't do much about it. There is one thing you can do about it, and that's lift weights, because it's tied to body mass. So your muscle mass, if you have more muscle, your basal metabolic rate will go up a little bit. But that's, that's not a, a big fix. The, the thing that we can do is the physical activity, and that's what the uh, soccer players are doing, is, is tremendous uh, expenditure of energy. So you know who these guys are? <laughs> this is from the cover of People magazine in 1995, um, and these are the OBOB OB mice. And the one on the left is the homozygous leptin knockout mouse. I mean, auto, auto, they knocked it out themselves. We didn't do it. And the litter mate with its normal weight is a heterozygous mouse. And the, the, in mice, the situation is pretty clear that the hypothalamus is what, where the control system is that determines satiety and hunger. This WAT is white adipose tissue, 
and the amount of white adipose tissue in mice correlates with the leptin that's secreted from adipose tissue into blood and then that goes up and interacts with several things in the hypothalamic area. And there are other things that can regulate hunger, but the early data on humans suggested that leptin was not important because it didn't seem to correlate. And this is one of the early studies that was published in the New England Journal, and it is showing the correlation between serum leptin and body fat. Now, these people up here with very high leptin levels, if it was working properly, they would stop eating. Mice would stop eating if you infused leptin. And so human obesity is associated with leptin resistance. It doesn't seem to do very well. And there's a cartoon that was published shortly after some of the studies, the early studies on leptin, where they actually did recombinant leptin and infused it into obese mice. And it worked. It suppressed appetite and neurosity, and increased physical activity, and sympathetic nervous system activity. So it worked quite well in mice. And drug companies, and I don't remember which one did this, but drug companies said, we're going to do this, and they paid millions of dollars to do and do human studies. And it didn't work. Confusing and rejecting leptin in humans has very little effect until you got to grand climate and suppression and far beyond what could be physiological. So there's still work going on in laboratories of drug companies to try to find some modification of the molecule to make it uh, more effective. But leptin has not turned out to be what we hoped it would be uh, in the early or the late 90s. But there's been some interesting stuff that was published recently, and I'm waiting for it to come out and do something. And that is that in house model, PPAR gamma, which is a widely uh, investigated system within most cells in the body, seems to be a mediator of the leptin resistance in mouse models of leptin resistance. And they showed that rosaglitazone, which is a, a drug that we use in diabetes management that's associated with weight gain, actually interacts, and we know it interacts with PPAR gamma to observe the beneficial effects of muscle and fat on insulin action. And it seems to work in the central nervous system to stimulate And what this guy Seeley presented was that he had a drug that was an antagonist of PPR gamma, which completely suppressed appetite in mice and made the obesity go away. We're talking three years ago. I haven't heard about much about it since then. But it suggests that there may be some interventions that can suppress appetite that, that work in humans to knock out that leptin resistance, which is um, an important part of why leptin doesn't seem to work in humans. So whose fault is this? <laughs> Who is at fault? This is advertising for Taco Bell. And Taco Bell, I mean, when you look at the other fast food places, there are choices in their menu. They're not bad. There are low fat, um, reasonable things, but that's not a good idea. The fourth meal is advertising in a country with a huge epidemic of obesity. So we make bad choices. But I think that the food industry is involved in the bad choices that we make. This is the BK stacker. And the quad stacker on the right has advertised, and I haven't seen the advertisement for a couple of years, it has four pieces, four pieces of bacon, and they don't waste any space with lettuce or tomato. <clears throat> and that's what they ever do. So the quad stacker is a thousand calories. This is a meal for a family. <laughs> this is not for you and me. <clears throat> Portion size, and we've seen a lot of this, but this is an example of what's going on. And Ray Kroc developed 
McDonald's in 1957, this was what regular fries were. This is large fries. It's three times the calories. And portion size in fast food and in many other aspects of the food that we buy is enticing because for a little bit more money, you get a lot more food. What a great buy. <laughs> and the, when this became widespread, which I can't tell exactly when it happened, but probably 20 years ago, the profit went up a lot. So you pay 25 cents more. It's right. It's the overhead. It's not. So the profit goes up, and we get a bargain. <laughs> they make more money. Coca-Cola in 1920. Coca-Cola today. Try to find something less than 20 ounces. And you look at the food label on. serving the half that you don't need. Well, you do. <clears throat> and this is, so what is this? 760 in 2008. This is something that was published in one of the industry magazines. The Beverage Digest in March of 2009. Soft drinks per capita in the United States. Every man, woman, and child takes in almost two eight ounce. I mean, where can you find an eight ounce? Well, there are eight ounce Cokes and stuff in these little cans, but we're talking about those of us who don't drink, there is somebody else who's having two or three Cokes every day. <coughs> the good news is that it's gone down a little bit since 2008. But we're talking about 11% of your daily calories. If you add it all up, we're talking about 81,000 calories per year. And if you don't make an adjustment in your diet, and that's all you do is take in two Cokes a day, you're going to gain 23 pounds a, a month, a year. <clears throat> and many people would say that soft drinks in the audience, soft drinks are sugar water. And it is thought that sugar water doesn't work very well for inducing satiety. Like if you eat a potato chip or, or eat a high fat meal, that is, has, uh, is good at inducing satiety. As it should be. But it's thought that sugar water, when you take it in, your body doesn't really notice all the calories you're taking in. So what about this stuff? This is high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup. It's got a bad name. Does it deserve a bad name? Yeah, it probably does. But this is data from the USDA looking at the kinds of sugar that have been used. And this is pounds per person in the United States. In 1970 or 71, Archer Daniels Midland developed the process for dealing with corn glucose that would make it sweeter. And they enzymatically take corn glucose from corn and they treat it with an enzyme that turns it into fructose. And the reason they did that is because they thought it was sweeter. And I think there's studies that show that it is sweeter and the other studies that show that it's not sweeter. that was underwritten by the U.S. government. And there's subsidies for corn that are not available for beets and cane. So as a source of sugar for soft drinks and for commercial baking, so what happened is that this type of corn comes as a liquid, which is preferable for, for making soft drinks or for commercial uh, baking. 
it was sold as being sweeter per gram and it was cheaper than cane sugar. That's a no-brainer. No Send those barrels of high fructose corn syrup over to my Coke plant. I guess this is good news right here. Between 2000 and 2005, there's a somewhat, there's a small decline in the pounds per person. And it has come down a little bit more. So you saw this graph already. Where does the high fructose corn syrup fit into this picture of something that happened about 1980? So that's pretty impressive. So is it the fructose? And I don't know. Fructose is bad in some ways. There are animal studies that show if you feed a very high fructose diet, you induce insulin resistance, obesity, and fatty liver in mice. There haven't been good human studies that suggest that it is harmful to humans. Um, so the high fructose corn syrup, the biggest use of it has been soft drinks. And I think that advertising and soft drink ingestion has gone up in parallel here. So is it... ...closely correlated with the obesity epidemic? Here's something from YouTube. <laughs> Probably was. <laughs> so, so, engaging commercials on television and, and Coca Cola advertising. You drink this, you will be happy. You will be happy. So, this isn't Coca-Cola, but this is advertising that's bad for you. I mean, and I think Hardee's is, is one that said, we're not going to advertise good food choices. McDonald's does. You know, we've got apples instead of fries. Hardee's is not wasting any time with that. <clears throat> so this is a scary slide. Um, this is you know, severely obese children sitting at McDonald's with stuff in front of them that they should never have. These huge um, volume of soft drinks and empty large uh, fries. And I've got a few more side, slides to talk about this. Uh, um, the food being at some fault or some responsibility in the obesity epidemic. And this is from a time when I thought somebody actually, well, we all heard about it, somebody actually sued McDonald's for their obesity problem. And it was thrown out of court. And I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah, it's choice, you know, you don't have to go to McDonald's. <clears throat> there's a cartoon that basically says the food police have been here and there's danger there are fast food restaurants ahead, the next two exits. But the is funding um, what, uh, groups of individuals to oppose food regulation, putting calories on news. They think it's bad for business. And this is suggesting that, um, well, the title, I don't know if you can read it there, but the title says the Center for Consumer Food responsibility and consumer choice. They don't, this is nonsense. Protecting consumer choice, they're hiding the data. They're hiding the data. Uh, calories on the menu. And this is a similar thing 
New Yorkers for beverage choices. Don't let Mayor Bloomberg ban beverages of 16 ounces or more. So who wants to fund this advertising? It's not public health people, I guarantee that. So we're pretty much running out of time, aren't we? Let's see. The problem is setting their lifestyle and it's unrestricted food and the solution is what your grandmother told you, eat less, exercise more, and you better do it from the time you're a kid until you are 100 years old. And this guy is somebody who you had here and, and uh, I attended the talk that he gave, Kessler, and he basically said that, that the overeating that we do is intentional manipulation of the food content to make it addictive. <laughs> but he's a guy who's responsible for this, for the food labels. When he was FDA director, he was able to push this through about the, in, the objections. to you done in the next three, four minutes. There are drugs that are available for weight management. Fentramine has been around forever. It's an appetite suppressant. It's been around 30 years. Xenocal and Fentramine are relatively safe. developed based on marijuana munchies. So it actually antagonizes the CD1 receptor in the hypothalamus. But, but, um, such a hydrocarbonyl interacts with the stimulus appetite. This creates that in the physical effect of the hypothalamus. And it did not get through the These last two or three drugs that have been approved in the last six months, and we don't know really the safety of these drugs, and I would not prescribe them. Yeah. And let it let it go on for a while. <laughs> it got pulled because there was like a five percent prevalence of uh, depression, of suicidal ideation, no suicides. But the FDA said that the drug company did not adequately address that issue, so they said nope. effective way of dealing with obesity is you've got to be bariatric surgery has long-term success, whereas nothing else we do has long-term success. And this is based on a meta-analysis that was published uh, four years ago. Have enough data to evaluate success at a year. What we saw was that there was a fairly high prevalence of many of the side effects of the But a lot of this is the slide that kind of shows the efficacy. It's a different study than a smaller study. But it shows that the, the ruin Y or the most aggressive surgery was the most effective. And this is a 10 year follow up with initial weight loss in the first year of nearly 40% and then sustained over a very long period of time. And one of the slides that I skipped through quickly shows that drug-induced weight loss is, works quite well. Romanabont was the, the drug that wasn't approved. But when you stop the drug, it comes back up within several months on average for the size of the group. So, what do we do today? I see on billboards 
drugs and television. In treatment, it's kind of not very effective no matter what we do. And I would summarize by saying, by saying obesity is a manifestation of a socially and culturally dictated lifestyle change. We have obesity today not because we have bad genes, it's because we've changed our behavior compared to our great grandparents who worked that long to get the food that they ate. Life expectancy is predicted to be shortened by obesity related consequences more than smoking within a decade. I say medical treatment of obesity is too late and that the, the main issue is prevention. And the prevention is society needs to work on it. It has to be complex, it has to be multifaceted, it has to be social and cultural. So what do we do? If a patient comes to you asking, you say, well, you gotta make better food choices. No soft drinks, they're bad guys. You can celebrate on your birthday or go to a party once in a while, but soft drink at every meal, a soft drink for breakfast? I'm medical students who come with a coat. Eat at home, don't eat out. Control portion size. And the carbs that you eat, the best ones are the, are the whole grains, the low glycemic index. And then increase physical activity. Whatever, wherever you are, do more. And this is an example of a way of doing that is 10,000 steps per day with a barometer. You get them six bucks at Walmart. 10,000 steps per day is five miles. And if you can do that, that counts as significant increase in physical activity. So, I ran over, but you guys are right. <laughs> Sorry. Any questions?